Hi, I'm Steve McCord, Cattaraugus County Director of Veteran Services, and this is Our Veterans, Their Stories, Preserving Our Heroes' Stories, One Story at a Time. I was 16 years old and I went to school from September till March. That's when I left school. My dad always, he was a contractor and he didn't believe in hiring outside help. He, there were six of us boys and we all took turns. I owed 60 excuses to West Valley School because they wouldn't make an excuse out of it. I said, it's your fault that I'm out of school. I got to be out here working for you, Dad. And they, they said, you could get in trouble, but they never... They never pursued it, you know, the school never pursued it, but I quit. There was no sense of me going to school. So then I just worked with him. Then I worked on different farms. Then I got a job at Ontario Knife Factory in 1957. And it was in January. I got 98 cents an hour to start out. I was 17 years old and happier than a dog to have a job. And I walked and hitchhiked for three weeks from Ashford Junction to Franklin, which is about seven, eight miles. Sometimes I didn't get a ride, sometimes I did. If I got a ride, I was happier than hell. But, and I worked there till in the, in the middle of the fall, and I says, I'm gonna go in the Marine Corps. So I took my tests, and then in January, January, I went into the Marine Corps. And before I left, they said, well, your job will be waiting for you when you come back, Bill. I said, all right. When I enlisted in the, in the Marine Corps, <clears throat> I f went out of Buffalo on a train, a troop train. And they had to have a battalion, f fill the battalion up. By the time we got to Paris Island, they stopped in every little town get a guy on here, a guy on there in the next town, in the next city. And it took three days to get down there to Paris Island. Well, we pulled into Buford, South Carolina. That's by Paris Island. And all I could hear was screaming. And I said, what in the hell did I get into? And it was the drill instructors waiting for the, us to get off that train and get in line. Oh, my God, how they screamed and hollered. Well, they marched us to a barracks. It was like two, three o'clock in the morning. They said, We're gonna you're gonna go to bed for a couple hours. They marched, then you gotta get up and and have chow and then go take tests all over again. So we went in this barracks and here's the mattress rolled up with a pillow inside the mattress. Where do you think we slept? On the springs, they says that's where you sleep. You're not worth any more than that. That's where you sleep on them springs. I, I couldn't believe it. I said, oh, what did I get into? But I was a farm boy. I was rugged as hell. So anyway, we went <clears throat> from there. We went for chow, and they run us like dogs, a hollering, screaming. And then we had to take all of our tests over again. If you didn't pass the test, you got back on another train and went home. But anyway, I went through boot camp, and I didn't have any problem with boot camp because I could do as many push-ups as their instructors could and sit-ups, all that stuff. And run, that's all they did was run you all the time. You got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and you went to bed, oh, 8, 9 o'clock, whenever he said lights are out. And when he'd come in the next morning, he'd have his swagger stick. He'd go in the garbage can, like that in the garbage can. Boy, you better fly out of that bunk and better be at attention when he was looking up and down because they were mean, mean, terrible mean. We had uh, four different drill instructors, and every morning you met one of them head on because they'd come and look you right in the eyes. It was unbelievable. I, I couldn't believe you could get treated like that. I don't know how they do it today, but that was unbelievable. They'd grab a hold of you and shake the heck right out of you if you didn't straighten up. You had three minutes. That three minutes was to go in the, the shit, shower, and shave. 
They call it the three S's. Three minutes, that's all you got. You'd better be out by the third minute, too. And back at attention. And, <clears throat> and then you get all squared away. They take you out for a nice five-mile run. Four o'clock in the morning run. And guess who run first? All of us short guys. The big guys run in the back. And the drill instructor was ahead of us. And he was long-legged, too. He was about six foot four big. Uh, Sergeant Jones was his name. Sometimes the shorter ones would go, but he could, almost every morning he was there. He must have just loved to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and meet us guys at 4. But anyway, you run five miles. Then when you got back, went up to the barracks, got squared away. Then you went to chow. And right after that, you drilled all day long till dark out of the drill field and went different classes for schooling on the, the M1 rifle and the 45 pistol and the machine gun, all that stuff. Yeah, so you learned how to be a, a combat trooper. And then you graduated, I, 13 weeks I think we were, then we graduated and we didn't go home like the pansies do today. We went right to combat training in Cape of June. For another five six weeks when you got through with that then you got about 14 days uh leave and then i got sent from from camp of june i got sent to clarksville base clarksville tennessee uh, uh that was an atomic base where they stored all that stuff and that was one of the bigger ones in the in the country i, I had a top secret clearance and all it was was high security guard you, you carried a 45 and you carried an M1 rifle, fully loaded at all times. And all it was, was you had some walking patrols, but most of them were in a vehicle patrolling. Around the outside perimeter, and then uh, they had four fences. The third one in would fry a egg if you put it against it. Because I remember a lot of times seeing a, a, a raccoon or a fox or a deer get against it killed them right out. The lights would come on, then you'd have to send a perimeter out there, uh, troops out there with machine guns, because you didn't know what was going on, to, to guard that area while they cleared that fence. That what, were you, uh, what were you guarding? The atomic energy, whatever it was. We couldn't say a thing about it for seven years after we were out of there. But in my notes there, it says it was one of the bigger atomic uh, places in the were country. Were nuclear missiles? We don't know what it was. You never knew. It was just nuclear. You know, it was atomic. That's what they called it, atomic uh, yeah. facility. You know, they called it the birdcage because it was all fenced in. And then you had patrols all on the inside going. You had seven, eight patrols going all, all night long on the inside. Then between the fences and then on the outside fence, you had patrols going. You know, it was unbelievable. That, that went on every... 24 hours a day, you were on eight hours and then you were off 16 or whatever you, you know, if, if maybe work three, four days right in a row, you know, eight hour shifts. Yeah. It was really good duty. You had to be sharp, you know, you had to wear your, usually you wore your khakis, you know, or half, if you stood the main gate, you had to really be sharp, which I stood the main gate and the Q gate. The Q gate was where the, all the, Civilians and the Navy personnel, they went through there to work down in them, in the hole, we call it. We never got, you know, you had to have a different kind of clearance to go down in there, in, into the, and guard in the, in the main production area, whatever it was, you know. We never knew that much about it, you know. And then they had all these big caves that went back in with big doors on it with locks and all that. You knew something was in there, but you didn't know what, what it was. And all in like rocks. It was unbelievable, you know. We stopped a lot of them. They were, and weren't supposed to take no pictures, and you know. And then you'd have to bring them back, and they'd question them. You know, you'd have the sergeant of the guard and somebody from, uh, oh, not the CIA, CIC, counterintelligence corps. They'd question of what they were doing out there, why they were taking pictures, stuff like that, you know. Boring, but it wasn't that bad. You had so many things to do on the, you know, you went to school when you, when we were off, like say, you got off at 
at eight o'clock in the morning and maybe take a little nap and then they'd get you up and you'd have schooling, training and different things, you know, weapons and stuff like that and physical training too. You'd have to go for a run every day, all, all different kind of stuff like that, yeah. Once they spend all that money on that top secret clearance, they don't want to ship you all over unless you re-enlist or... I heard it that they were around asking. People were around asking. Because some of the people said when I come home on leave, what the hell did you do, Bill? I said, what do you mean, what did I do? We had people here asking, you know, where you went to school and what kind of work you did and what kind of person you were. It was unbelievable, you know. It was the people that were trying to get the intelligent on me to, you know, to give me the secret, the top secret clearance. You know? What were the type of people they asked? Oh, everybody. Some of the neighbors, some of the people downtown that I hardly even knew, you know. They even went in some of the restaurants and the bars. You know, they, is he a drunk? You know, what, what kind? No, he has a couple of beers. Yeah, yeah, that was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever find out what was going on in Tennessee? Did nope. you ever, did you ever, did anybody ever tell you? No. Nope. We, we used to, sh we had shipments that went out to the Air Force and they went up in the plane, you know, they had opened that big bay door and this big round thing, they'd put it up into the, in fact, on the way there, we had to set a perimeter up on every roadblock, like if crossroads, we had the machine guns, guns going each way. And then as soon as they went by, Another one went ahead of us and set up a roadblock on the next one. And then we had to get up and set up another roadblock on the next four four intersections. You know, it was on. Then you went to the plane. You had to set up a machine guns all the way around the plane. So you didn't know what the hell it was, but you figured that it's got to be something to do with the atomic bomb or uh, atomic something. You know, because it was really top secret. You couldn't tell anybody what you what you were doing. Yeah. Did they have their own airport? Oh yeah, well the Air Force had their... See, I was on Fort Campbell, Kentucky. That was... Clarksville Base is attached to, to, to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which is a big 101st Airborne. And then they had the Air Force. The Air Force takes some paratroopers up and they jump. And that's where we had to go with our... whatever they were taking there. And... Uh, put it on the plane and you set up, then as soon as they got it on the plane and the plane taxied off, then you set up, you went back to the barracks or, you know, went back to the, to your uh, base. But it was very, you know, you, you took it serious. You didn't know what the hell was on there. This, this was right through the base, right through Fort Campbell, Kentucky to the Air Force Base. The Air Force Base was, uh, was Stewart. They were hooked right to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. In fact, I was a, I belonged to the NCO club there uh, at the Air Force Base, and I used to go there every Sunday and have a couple of brewskis, you know. If you had two stripes, you could get in. If you didn't, you didn't get in. You know? How many men did you have under you? There was about 40 of us in our, yeah, at least 40 in our, yeah, I, I, I was always a, a squad leader from, you know, when I started making a little rank. Then when I got to be corporal, the last four months I was active platoon sergeant because our our sergeant got shipped away and they didn't replace him. So they kept me in there acting till I got discharged. Yeah. What was um what was going on in the world militarily well, when you were uh, there was in... a lot of problems with Lebanon at that time over there in the you know, Israel and Lebanon and that area. A lot, a lot of times we got called, get your duffel bag packed, you might have to get shipped out. They they said, we're going to take so many people from this base and so many people, and they're going to have to go over there. But we never had to go over. But several times I had to get my, everybody got their bag packed. You didn't know who the hell was going to get called out, but you got your bag packed, just stand by it, then that, a couple of days later, they'd say, all right, you can unpack everything. We're not going over there. And it was unbelievable, the things that were going on. And that was, well, towards the end is when Vietnam was getting started. But I, I thought for sure I was going to get called back in there. 
because I had all that combat training, you know, to go over there, but I didn't have to. No. How many years, how long did you have to be um, in active duty? Yeah, three years. But yeah. that was active duty. Yeah, I was three years active and three years inactive. That I, you know, that you could get called back any time in that time. But I never got called back. I thought for sure, because I told my wife, you know, we, right after we got married, I says, you never know, I might have to go anyway, and I don't want no black. <laughs> but I never did, you know. This is from the commanding officer, commanding officer, Marine Barracks. Recommendation for meritorious promotion, case of Private First Class William Lindbergh. And then I give my serial number, 1803971, sir. I always remember that you never forget that in the United States Marine Corps. And it, and it said, Private First Class meets the pre-requirement pre set forth in reference a, and is hereby recommended for meritorious promotion to the grade of Lance Corporal, E3. His current conduct and proficiency marks are both 4.8. He increased his score on the general military subjects proficiency test from 63.3 63 in November 1958 to 72.0 in March of 59. He has had no court martials or no jurisdictional punishments during his current enlistment. He presents a neat, well-groomed appearance at all times. He carries out all orders and in a cheerful, willing, and competent manner. He has been actively enrolled in the enlisted basic extension course since November 1958 in an effort toward self-improvement. And it's signed by Captain F. P. Turner. Yeah. He was a he's the one that got me. He was a got me doing uh, compensate or uh, more courses. So he says the more courses you take, the more rank you're going to make. So I was very fortunate to to make Lance Corporal, and that was in uh, I'll tell you. It was in May 21st of 1959. I'd been in there not even a year and a half. And usually after two years, you might make Lance Corporal. But that was given to me. And they had a big doing. They, they had the whole company come out and stand, you know, in the, in the, out, out, out on the drill field. And, yeah. and then they called your name and you had to march up and the captain shook your hand and, and spoke to everybody, you know, all of this about how, what kind of a thing I was doing, you know, uh, doing my courses, and I always had spit shine shoes. You could shave with my shoes. That's how I kept everything neat and sharp, and it paid off. What were the courses? Oh, it was all about, like, machine guns and mortars, all that, different things about the military, you know military dress code, all of that. Everything that involved you in the military, you know, which was good, you know, you know. Another year after that, I made Corporal E4. Mm -hmm. Took the test and made Corporal. And then the last four months, as I said before, I had to, uh, I was acting platoon sergeant because our sergeant got shipped out. I got the role of being a hero, you know. And then I got discharged and came home <laughs> and went right back to the damned old knife factory. That's why I'm so sharp. <laughs> I spent 32 years there. And the last few years that, that I was there, I farmed too. And that was really tough duty. You know, I did both jobs. And I was milking 44 cows and going down there. I got up every morning for 15 years at 2.30 in the morning. Milked my cows, took took a shower, got cleaned up, and I was a boss down there. And one day my boss just kind of ticked me off, and I told him to stick it and walked out. They wrote me a good many letters and called me a good many times to come back. I said, no, there ain't no coming back. I'm done. You know. How long did you work there? 
32 years I worked here. 32 years in one month. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was in supervision for the last 25 years. I was a maintenance foreman for a long time, and then they wanted me on production supervision. And what a horrible job that was. You run your head off. Yeah. Yeah, we, we made lots and lots of knives, a lot of government, we did a lot of government contracts, you know, you know, that was something different. I rented a place and you didn't make nothing for wages. I think I got 15 cents an hour more when I got out. So I, they give you a nickel a year. So I made about less than a dollar 20 cents an hour. It was a, I made as much in the Marine Corps as I did there. But anyway, uh, I moved in with my sister. She says, you pay for a third of everything and you can live with us. So I lived right across from a huge farm. And I was always on that farm because I love farming. And they said, Bill, why don't you come and live with us? All you have to do is work 15 hours a week on the side, you know. And that's for your room and board. Boy, I ate that right up. So I moved in with them, and I, once in a while I go to town. Well, the one time I went to town, I was sitting with my buddy having a beer, and Jeanette came in with her mother and father. And I told my bu buddy, I says, who's that cute little heifer? Because that's what I always called her, a cute little heifer. He, he says, that's Jeanette. They call her Nettie. And uh, he said, would you like to meet her? I says, I was kind of shy. I wasn't really too much. I never figured I'd ever get married because I loved working in the factory and I loved working on the farm. So I talked to her a minute and, and uh, then I uh, talked to my buddy. He says, if you want a date with her, all you got to do is call her up. I'm quite sure she'd go out with you, Bill. She's a real nice girl. So I waited about three or four months. <laughs> That's how shy I was. And I called her up. She said, sure, I'd love to go out with you. So that was the start of it. And I took her out. And we were in, went together for a year. We got engaged. And we bought all of our furniture before we got married. We went to the, there used to be a beautiful uh, furniture store in Franklinville. And I said, let's go pick our furniture out. We picked every bit of it out, all new. I says, well, I'll pay a down payment on it, and I'll pay so much a week. And by the time we were married a year later, it was all paid for. When we went on our, got married, went on our honeymoon, the furniture store delivered it and set it all up in our new apartment. And then we went on a, a vacation for a honeymoon for a week up in the Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont. We had a wonderful time. You know, I had a Volkswagen at that time. I called it a pregnant roller skate. A beetle. Beetle. And we went 1,550 miles, and it cost me $15 for gas. Oh, that was a wonderful little buggy. Well, anyway, she had to start driving to work because she worked in Olean in the unemployment office. She worked there several years. And every time she'd get in it, she'd grind the gears, and it just drove me crazy. So I didn't really want to get rid of it, but I says, well, let's get rid of it. We traded it and bought a brand new 64 Dodge Dart, the first new car I ever had. Mm -hmm. And we got married in 1963. Well, then we bought the Dodge Dart, but we were married for 56 years, you know.